if you're one of those people that finds the sort of um, bashing of religion and stuff tiresome or uh, offensive, just give me five more minutes. <laughs> I know the good book's good because the good book says it's good. I know the good book knows it's good because a really good book would. You wouldn't cook without a cookbook and I think it's understood. You can't be good without a good book because it's good and it's a book and it is good for cooking. Now, after the death of Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, mostly because the adults of Israel were not paying attention to them at the time, saying, The mass murder, genocide, ethnic cleansing, brutality, rape, slavery, hatred, discrimination, misogyny, homophobia, animal cruelty, and child molestation contained in this 3,000-year-old book of stupid is under no circumstances suitable for younger audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. So, before the parents get themselves all butthurt, over the things that will be contained in this video series, perhaps thou shalt pay attention to what thine children are viewing on the internet instead of blaming an anonymous YouTuber. Please be reminded that I am only showing thee exactly what doth be written in the Bible, the holy, unchangeable, inspired word of Todd, which is perfectly accurate and non-contradictory, filled with the utmost lessons of morality, ethics, and righteousness. And let us not forget that this is also the very best source of histories that we can possibly shove down the throats of our school children. So, let us now continue on with the same pattern of horrifying Bronze Age bloodshed and brutality that was contained in the Literally Joshua series, so there is no sense trying to change it now. That, having all been said, who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first, to fight against them? And the Lord, who has absolutely nothing to do with this particular situation, neither commanded he the Israelites to commit any of the aforementioned acts of mass murder, definitely did not say, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. See? Todd had nothing to do with it. And Judah said to Simeon his brother, Come up with me into my lot that we may fight against the Israelites, and likewise will I go with thee into thy lot. And Simeon thought that Judah was insane. After all, this is the completely accurate and literal word of Almighty Todd. Since this verse is to be taken literally, that means that two and only two smelly on wash bottom stage staff wielding goat herders went to fight against an entire army of Canaanites. Sure, that scenario may sound outlandish, but it falls right in line with everything else in this book is stupid. And Judah went up, because Simeon walked to the top of the hill and saw just how big the Canaanite army really was, and he said to Judah, Screw you guys, I'm going home. And the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Parasites into their hand. The Perizzites having to decide to join the fight even though they were bugger all worth mentioning up to this point. And they slew of them in Bezek 10,000 men. Now this particular verse specifies not what happened to the women and children of Bezek, but the Bible doth clearly command that married women are to be brutally killed, boys are to be killed or captured as slaves, and little girls are to be married. The marriage ceremony consisting of the underage girls having their hair shaved off, their fingernails cut, being shoved into a cluster for 30 days and then raped. As you can see, there was a clear and undeniable reason why the men of Bezek did not want these smelly Bronze Age goat herders raided in their village. And they found Adonai Bezek and Bezek. Well, isn't that the understatement of the year? Adonai Bezek simply means Lord of Bezek, so I would wonder where the bloody hell they thought the leader of the village might be located. They fought against him, then they slew the Canaanites and the Parasites. But Adonai Bezek fled, just as Judah was about to reach him. And he said unto Judah, Na, 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 na. And he did stick his tongue out him. And Judah answered and said, I'll get thee yet, boy, just thou waitest and see. And they pursued after him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and great toes. And Judah said, And now tryest thou to get away, punk. And Adonai Bezek said, Three score and ten kings, Psst, that means seventy, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table and then fed it to the dogs, because they were full, and besides, they did not like my wife's cooking. As I have done, so Todd hath requited me. And Adonai Bezek thought it that he would gather his meat under Joshua's table, but Joshua had other plans. And they brought him to Jerusalem for some unspecified reason, and there he died, quite possibly, in the violence that would ensue in the next verse. Now, the children of Judah, whose names were Bob, Leroy, and Scooter, had fought against Jerusalem and had taken it and spitten it with the edge of the sword in a scene that was right out of Monty Python's Holy Grail movie, and set the city on fire, 
So there was bugger all left of it when Judah brought Adonibazek into the smoldering heap of ruins that was once a large and important city to die in desolation and hunger and turmoil boredom. And in no way doth this verse appear to be an interpolation written after the fact to explain why the city of Jerusalem suddenly appeared in the middle of this chapter when it was bugger all worth mentioning up to this point. And afterward, the children of Judah went down to fight the Canaanites that dwelt in the mountains and in the south and in the valley, which must have been a fairly easy task since their father, the mighty goat herder before the Lord, had already done so. And Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron, the city that was already destroyed, and all of its inhabitants, and literally Joshua, so this must also have been a fairly quick job. Now, the name of Hebron before was Kirjabara, in case thou wantest to know. No? Uh, neither did I to tell the truth, and they slew Shishai and Ahiman and Talmai, who were also bugger all worth mentioning, and no one doth even know who the bloody hell they are. Apparently they were the only inhabitants left in the village from the last time the Israelites burned into the ground. And they did sit in a tent, drink a beer, and telling one another about the good old days. And from thence he went against the inhabitants of Debir, which was also destroyed in literally Joshua. And the name of Debir before was Kerjeshaphar, in case that was wondering. And Caleb, who was an old man living on the top of a mountain, said, He that smiteth Kerjeshaphar, which we have decided to call Debir, he that smiteth Debir, and taketh it to him I will give Latsha, my daughter, to wife. Of course, if this verse is to be taken literally, then according to Joshua chapter 14, Caleb would have had to be at least 84 years old, so his daughter would be well into her 60s, and she was old and wrinkly, and everything had long since dried up down there, if thou catchest my drift. So, naturally, there were no takers. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who the Book of Judges mentions only because he becomes important a bit later, finally volunteered, mostly because everybody else on the line quietly took one step backwards, and he was not paying attention. So Othniel took it, it being the beer, also known as Kirjasifer, and he gave him, him being Caleb and him being Othniel, his old and decrepit daughter to wife. And Asha said unto Othniel, who was both her husband and her first cousin, It's about bloody time I got married. It's damn lucky we're both too old to have children, for they would have four fingers on each hand and webbed toes. And Othniel told his wife the story of Abraham and Sarah, which the viewer may find, retold in exhaustive detail in literally Genesis. And it came to pass, when he said unto him, she being Asha and him being Othniel, that she moved him to ask of her father a field, and she alighted from off her ass, as her husband did tell her to ask him herself. After all, he was her own damn father. And Caleb said unto her, What the bloody hell wantest thou this time? And she said unto him, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a southland, give me also springs of water, and a pony, and a sports car, and a million dollars, and a jet plane, and my own private doctor, and finance my college education, and send me on a three-day, all-expenses-paid holiday to Jamaica. And if thou hast anything left over, my husband doth want a power drill and a new video game system. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the other springs just to shut her up, and made a mental note to give her all that other crap for her birthday. Assuming, of course, that either of them lived that long. And the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, who were bugger all worth mentioning up till now, went up out of the city of palm trees with the children of Judah, Bob, Leroy, and Scooter, into the wilderness of Judah with Lyoth in the south of Arad, if thou even care to know. And they went and dwelt among the people. Yes, thou guessest it. In no way is this an interpolation added to the text after the pact. And Judah went with Simon and his brother to the local honky duck bar because they sure did want to get into a bit of a scrap with them, their local boys, I tell us thee what. And they slew the Canaanites and inhabited Zephath, and utterly destroyed the religious, a completely different scenario from the last two times they slew the Canaanites. And the name of the city was called Horma, which is a vitally important piece of information that thou mayest want to write down. Also Judah, all alone and by himself, took Gaza with the coast thereof, and Ascalon with the coast thereof, and Ekron with the coast thereof, but let's face it, only Gaza and the coast thereof is important these days, is it not? And the Lord was with Judah, as he suddenly materialized in the middle of the battlefield, and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, saying, Thou art three months behind in your mortgage, and at this time the bank shall foreclose upon thee. Go on, get the bloody hell out. But he could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had chariots of iron, and trust thou me when I tell thee, they knew how to use them. It would seem that Almighty Todd wasn't all that mighty. 
And they gave Hebron to Caleb, as Moses said, even though, according to the Torah, Moses said no such thing. And he expelled them the sons of Anak, because if thou wantest to take over a particular parcel of land, the most moral and ethical thing to do is to expel the rightful owners of the land. And the children of Benjamin, Bo, Henry, and the sons of Hilda, did not drive out the Jebusites and have in Jerusalem, even though Todd, being an omnipotent and omniscient deity, promised the Israelites that no one would be able to fight against them. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day, and they are still there in modern times, 3,000 years later. And the house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel. And the Lord was with them, and we can presume that to mean the Lord was with the people of Bethel, so the house of Joseph would have had a fairly difficult time conquering it. And the house of Joseph sent to describe Bethel. Now the name of the city before was Luz, which seems legit, and doesn't seem to indicate at all yet another damned interpolation. And the spies, who were bugger all worth mentioning up to now, saw a man who shall remain unidentified because he is a ninja come forth out of the city. And they said unto him, Shew us, I pray thee, for we are barefoot, and our feet do hurt like the dickens. No. Oh, wait a minute. Show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we will shew thee mercy, which is a fairly rare occurrence in this book of stupid. And when he shewed them the entrance to the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword. And the soldiers in the city said unto them, Wow, that's the stupid impersonation of a Monty Python movie. And the house of Joseph was wroth, and stopped smiting the city, and smote the people instead. But they let go the man, the unidentified ninja, and all his family, and given how people normally dress in that area of the world, they looked like ninjas too. And the man, the unnamed ninja, went to the land of the Hittites to build a city on rock and roll, and called the name thereof Luz, which is the name thereof unto this day. So it's a good thing the Israelites decided to change the name of Bethel. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheen and her towns, nor Tanakh and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Ibeline and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Medigo and her towns, but the Canaanites did dwell in that land, completely oblivious to the fact that if the Bible is the completely accurate word of Almighty Todd, who stated in no uncertain terms that none of the Canaanites would be able to fight against the Israelites, then their verse would not exist. Neither would the following verse. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites in tributes, and did not utterly drive them out. At least the Israelites proved Todd to be correct on other occasions, and the other ethnic minorities in the Promised Land will do what Todd commanded and lay down and die. So, since the Book of Judges is the non-contradictory word of Almighty Todd, the rest of this chapter does not exist. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites, neither did Zebulon drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, nor the inhabitants of Nathalol. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko, Zidon, Ahab, Achzeb, Helba, Zephic, or Rehob. Boy, those are hard to pronounce. Neither did Nephtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, or Death and Ath, also hard to pronounce, and the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains. So, as you can see, the Israelites were always successful and drove out all the inhabitants of the land at all circumstances, just like Todd told them they would. Which proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Bible is a completely accurate, non-contradictory, inspired word of Almighty Todd, which is to be taken literally. Oh wait, Todd, damn it! Yeah, good is good and evil's bad, and kids get killed and God gets mad. You better.